Hello and welcome to UWO Now. UWO Now is the place where we talk to the students, staff, faculty, and alumni at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. I'm your host, Wendell Ray. For the last several years, businesses and organizations around the United States have been discussing DEI, which stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. There has been support and there's been some pushback, and we're fortunate today to be able to discuss this topic with a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, who is a leader in this area. Wendy Lewis has held executive leadership positions with the Chicago Cubs, the Commissioner's Office for Major League Baseball, and McDonald's Corporation. Wendy Lewis, welcome to UWO. Thanks so much for coming by and talking to us. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you, Wendell. Good to be here, and it's wonderful to be back on campus. Yeah, being back on campus. Tell us about uh, your experience here before we get into DEI, about mm -hmm. your path to um, our campus, and what it was like when you were a student here. It's an interesting pathway uh, because my intention originally was not to come to uh, UW Oshkosh. I had... Um, other selections and I discovered very quickly during freshman orientation at one of them that that wasn't the place for me that I wanted to go somewhere um, that was smaller uh, that I would know less people and maybe have more of an opportunity for me to just explore on my own uh, so Oshkosh seemed to be the right place for that and it turned out to be a very wise decision um, here at Oshkosh uh, was my introduction of living alone or you know living outside of my home first time away not first time away because we you know did all kind of off-site stuff as kids all right but uh truly first time away in terms of you now live here and i knew that for the most part i would be here often and just go back and forth to milwaukee uh, for work and um so that in itself was quite an experience um i think uh very often uh, for some students coming in, if they haven't had a lot of experience for that, I think very often the student, much less the parents, really know how to prepare uh, mm -hmm. them for that, whether it's from the cost of doing that or just the actual socialization of that. Um, one of my, um, I'll say, early diversity experiences here at Oshkosh was actually my roommate. Um, uh, lovely lady, her name is Kathy. And uh, Kathy assumed I was white uh, because my name is Wendy. And mm -hmm. I guess all the other Wendy's in her world had been other white women. So when she met me, which is, you know, in her room, she enters the room expecting someone very different. Mm -hmm. And it was obvious in her eyes and her demeanor and her tone. But it actually turned out to be a, a hysterical moment, <laughs> more <laughs> for her than me. <laughs> and we got along absolutely great. Okay. Uh, but, Wendy, I'll tell you one of the things that Kathy and I did one enchanted evening, we decided to sort of check out each other's lives. So she came to an event with me that was attended by all black students at the time. And I went to an event with her that was attended by all white students at the time. And then we just sort of took notes and had discussion. It was a, it was a challenging uh, event, I'll say, for both of us. And, but uh, was a great learning more for her than for me because I had uh, very often in the past been a very... Uh, typically all white environments or me being the only sure. one or one of the few, but that was brand new for her. So that was uh, one way for me to get immersed into the culture here quickly. So you mentioned that that was a little challenging for you. Tell us how, or for both of you, for her, what, were, what was it like? Tell us about the experience in that exchange. That's pretty novel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever heard of roommates doing something like that, uh, but it may be common. But it certainly is something I, I hadn't heard of at this point in my life. But that was, what was the impetus for that? And what were the challenge of that, challenges that you talk about with that little exchange you did? The impetus for it was that we had become very friendly. And um, she had never really spent time with or lived with or really known, uh, you know, black folks before. And so there was a lot of curiosity on her part. Like I said, I was more used to sort of juxtaposing, you know, that than she was. And so it was almost a, a challenge. Um, plus, I think I've, when people ask often uh, the work that I do, how did you come to do this work? I literally tell folks I was born this way. I was mm -hmm. born in a very um, 
multicultural environment, just an eclectic you know, in Milwaukee. group of people. In Milwaukee, because um, my folks were also part of the great migration mm-hmm. uh, that came from the South to the North, you know, escaping Jim Crow and so forth. Um, however, my family was very mixed, and we spent a lot of time together, uh, reunions and so forth. And also, the block, my neighborhood, uh, which was a cul-de-sac, ended up being one of the most, I will say, interracial, intercultural, uh, multicultural experiences I've ever had in my whole life. I've never seen a place that was so uh, infused with kind of everybody, uh, whether that was race or that was culture, whether that was religion, whether it was food. Uh, so anyway, I think uh, Kathy's curiosity on this was, was greater than mine, but I'm always game <laughs> for, mm-hmm. for, for that experience. And... What it turned out to be, Wendell, was a great experience for both of us, but a reminder to both of us, and that brings me pretty current day, that the whole ideal of diversity and inclusion very often does not come naturally, is not, uh, very often cannot be wanted. And folks that lead it and want to participate in it, it is work. And you work through the personal challenges of being accepted, being rejected, being embarrassed, being afraid, um, but most importantly, being willing, um, but also on both sides, giving each other grace to understand uh, each other better uh, because you want to be a more whole person. And we only get to believe, I believe, to be whole people from the reliance on each other. That cul-de-sac that you lived in in Milwaukee, Mm -hmm. You, how did it shape you? What did you learn? How did you grow? And ultimately, how, has, how did that make you Wendy Lewis? It helped me see very early how much more fun it was uh, to uh, experience sports in different ways. Uh, we played everything because it was a cul-de-sac in the street. Right. So whether it was kickball, baseball, you know, um, we stopped doing tackle football. People started getting hurt, so we started doing flag football. <laughs> yes. um, Makes and sense. I, because it was everybody. So, all, you know, women, men, boys, girls, all of it, all mixed up. And because it was almost um, a gated community, because all the families were so uh, protective of course their own kids but also the others because we were so much together Mm -hmm. you literally went in each other's homes and you experienced different food um for instance this current time we're experiencing a range of religious holidays so imagine being in an environment where you are with people who are practicing their religious holiday of christianity with holy week and then easter but also ramadan Mm -hmm. and also passover Mm -hmm. and all the symbolism and reflection goes along with that so that was great curiosity for me as well as satisfaction but also um very very much entrenched in life as an african-american particularly uh, those coming out of the south to the north i was the first child in my family, born in the North. So my siblings, you know, my parents, they all came from various parts of the South, primarily Mississippi. So also that whole exposure. How did they world. adapt then to um, a multicultural environment? Or were they coming from one? And if not, how did they adapt? You know, it. Um, there were enough other black families there that they saw uh, some semblance of what they were used to. Uh, but because very often in my dad's case of um, his experience in the war, uh, my mother's uh, being an educator, they were used to other people. So there wasn't anyone on the block that wasn't representative of someone who was a part of their former lives. Um, But they were so appreciative to just have the opportunity of home ownership, you know, of better jobs and opportunities for their families. They just knew that's what came with it. What sort of a benefit as far as they're concerned? At the same time, being able to hold on to their own history. Uh, for instance, having my grandparents mm-hmm. also come to Milwaukee and live right across the street. Oh, great. So it was kind of the best of, of all worlds. You're listening to UWO Now. I'm your host, Wendell Ray, and today we're talking with UWO graduate and uh, HR expert, Wendy Lewis. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, DEI, but getting to know Wendy, her background, and 
uh, how her background shaped who she is, as it does all of us. Um, now, tell us about uh, how that transition to uh, Oshkosh maybe could have was a was smoother for you. Wasn't such a shock for you as it could be for some who uh, may not be used to being at a predominantly white institution. How was that maybe a little easier for you when you made the transition from Milwaukee to UWO? It was easier for me, uh, but also gave me opportunity to be, I think, very helpful some of, for some of my other classmates and students. I understood both sides and where they were coming from. Um, and sometimes that could produce an awful lot of fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, 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 and other times... Uh, some calamity, but in addition to just... Um, That's a great word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. but in addition to all the other folks, there was such an opportunity here to try other things. If you tried other things, it was going to be more, going to be more representative of more white students than not. For instance, I ran for one of the student government positions. I can't even tell you now what it was. Okay. But... I knew that was going to be a lonely place. I mean, I didn't get the, uh, you know, election, but just a willingness to even do that. Um, Participated in the intramural sports. Um, I was in the pom-pom team. I mean, who does that, right? (laughs) Hey. (laughs) And so having that sense of adventure, wanting to try new things, Um, It was always going to be occupied here by a lot of people other than black folks, uh, people who, you know, were raised like me, came from communities like me. And so it just uh, yielded itself that you got to grow along with it. And so to that end, sometime coming back to the dorm or when you're hanging out with friends, there would be sometimes, uh, you know, almost a joke like, what are you doing now? (laughs) But. You know, we had the multicultural center. Okay. We call the Black House. Okay. And at the end of the day, that's where you could just go and unload and just get it all done. And then one of the um, greatest social uh, experiences that I had here was pledging my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. Okay. And meeting all these wonderful women who today we still keep in contact with each other. And some of the things that we always go back to. Or our days in Oshkosh. I see the red glasses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so then you leave UWO, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. tell us about what happens once you leave the campus after you graduated. I leave, and I go straight to uh, wife and motherhood. Uh, literally, I gave birth to my children before I even graduated, so I actually had to come back uh, to March. And so unlike my friends and classmates who went on to the next level, you know, of education or to um, their future careers. And it had a lot to do with my first birth. They were twins. Mm, okay. And so I stayed home with my kids. All right. And um, so I eventually went back to work part time. And I'm one of those who slowly but surely got back into it and then like never stopped. Um, and so it has always been, was that the design once you got, excuse me for interrupting, but was that the design once you had your children, you said, okay, I I know eventually I want to go back or did it just kind of happen? Oh, I always want to go back. Plus I knew what I wanted and there's no way we were going to get that without me going back to work. Okay. Um, both of my parents also were educators. Uh, mom taught, uh, from daycare all the way through high school and dad taught in various trade schools. Mm. And so the importance of education has just always been like the brand of our family. So I knew two things. One, you will complete this undergraduate education no matter what. And then if you are going to achieve the level of scholarship and prosperity that you want to, you're gonna go back eventually for an advanced degree. So completing education was always um, what I was determined to do but wanting to do more, knowing that an education would help was also what I've always wanted to do. And then what was the first job? What was uh, the, the, how did you jump back in? The first job where it makes a difference that I had a college okay. degree was actually working for, uh, it was called Lutheran Child and Family Services. Mm-hmm. Um, they did adoption services and, and a number of things. And I um, got what was a created role. It was new for them, it was new for me. 
And it ended up being my first entree into human resources. And so the job was called a personnel coordinator. I will never forget it. Okay. Um, because <laughs> I had to learn everything yeah. that turned out to be, you know, a great baseline for becoming eventually a human resources uh, professional and an executive. Did you find that this was a good fit? I mean, that even though it was a little daunting because it was new and you had to learn so much, did you find that it was still a good fit for you? It was uh, because for me, you know, the fits have always been something that is very dependent upon people and the interactivity with people, but also the business component of it. Um, so all of a sudden having to manage and create payrolls, you know, having to manage a budget around human resources, that mix was really ideal for me uh, because I wasn't one of the service providers, uh, which were social workers, uh, but just hearing their stories and knowing how I was supporting what it is that they needed to get done, it, it felt almost like ministry. Um, so it was a it was a very cool, cool, mm -hmm. cool job to have um, and a great appreciation for the work uh, that folks do who literally are our social scientists uh, today. Um, so it's not a, not a degree that I wanted, but it was a great place uh, for me to discover some of my skills. Uh, when was the leap to more involved, um, uh, involved HR, higher level HR stuff? When did that actually happen for you? I, I had an opportunity while I was with the uh, social services um, agency to uh, go to work for Chicago Tribune. And um, it was for a, um, a, an HR role uh, at the management level. And that was just uh, a wonderful experience. One of the things I tend to do is if I can, go to where I imagine one day I want to be. So um, it did. I didn't lose time on whenever I was in the downtown area walking along Michigan Avenue and looking up at the Tribune Tower and saying, you know, one of these days. Now, I didn't know then, but it was one of those days. And so I did have the opportunity to work there, you know, at the Tribune Tower. Uh, but being in the HR role, um, and, you know, in publication uh, was one thing, but being a part of a Tribune company, um, that was uh, something that uh, really was a, a huge impetus for my career uh, because uh, the HR role uh, gave you the opportunity to have uh, relationships and provide support services, everything from uh, recruitment to other a variety of uh, HR issues for all these different departments. So I really, you know, had uh, uh, some relationships with the folks, uh, not only in editorial, uh, but also in marketing, also in finance, also in building services. It was, mm -hmm. was wonderful. Um, so it was an incredible opportunity to, again, not only hone the craft, uh, but just see the application of what could be and what might, might be missing. Now, I didn't know then that that was actually feeding my appetite or what eventually would become the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Because one of the things that I saw too often in just, the, I'll say the more conventional HR role, like it used to be, not like it is today, uh, was why I could see the human relations component of it. And a lot of times operating so poorly mm -hmm. uh, and actually being very unsuccessful, particularly uh, for women and people of color, and particularly people of color, black folks, understanding why folks did not get to um, areas that they aspire to. I could see all the faults being in the HR role. Okay. And so I have uh, took very early a, a liking to almost wanting to analyze what's wrong here. And that's a different step. Because many people who are in HR just... And, uh, Many people in their jobs just do their jobs, not whether it's HR or any other field. But you took some initiative to study what was happening that you didn't see, that you saw that was not good to try and make some change. Um, and you're dealing with all levels. of One thing about HR is you deal with executives, middle management, management, uh, contractors. You deal with um, unions, laborers, all sorts of folks. So now you're seeing this all these different strata 
of individuals and getting to know them and understanding how to work. So what was it that you saw that was keeping certain groups from uh, um, positions that they might want? And then what would you do about it? I would see a, a failure for opportunity. Um, and I'll say a failure for opportunity because I was also on the same side of college recruiting. So I was actually going to schools and managing some of the uh, interview sessions and panels. And I would see this variety of all kind of folks, including people of color, in terms of the student population. So I thought it would be wonderful, right, um, to be a part of the employee base, but people just not making it to their final round. I also would see people who had been in the organization for a long time and in some cases become quite content with the levels that they were had aspired to. They had their ceiling and it was uh, self-imposed and that's the way they liked it. But I also saw folks who just did everything possible that a person can do to get to that next level, whether it was take this class, take this training, be willing mm-hmm. to, um, you know, take the roles that weren't just upward bound, but also, you know, vertically, horizontally, whatever it took and still not achieve. And that just left me discouraged and disappointed because it's like, what is missing here? And you can write it off to, at the time, what folks would have called prejudice today. They, you know, will call it, may call it, you know, a variety of other things. Um, But I also saw where there were managers who were willing to bring people through and be just as what we now call inclusive and helpful and supportive, and it still fall flat. So what I learned over time was the ineffectiveness of the system uh, to not only bring people in, but to really create real retention uh, and have real advocacy for promotion. And I used to develop my own way of looking at it, and it would be everything from who was recruited, you know, who made it to which pool population, um, how quickly were people promoted? And, and so I just sort of had all of these, um, what we now call analytics, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, in, in performance standards. And so for me, it was always questionable that it's not enough to just say, this is a problem of race. This is also a problem of just literally systemic behaviors that if we really don't create real work around it and make it as important as finance, as technology, as marketing, other areas of organizations, then we're just going to always keep revolving doors and people will find less uh, joy uh, in the work. And organizations will lose a fortune on talent that's, that's you know, not inclusive but elusive because they won't be able to keep it. How were you able to get these positions? Now, let me just uh, talk about You mentioned you worked at the Tribune. Chicago Tribune, which didn't just own the newspaper, but owns many media organizations across the country. You work for McDonald's as the global chief diversity officer. You've been uh, with, as I mentioned, Chicago Cubs. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but you were uh, with the Chicago Cubs and also with the commissioner's office for Major League Baseball in these types of roles, developing programs that brought uh, millions, billions of dollars in for new groups of contractors and people doing business with Major League Baseball. How was it then, you saw these flaws in systems, how were you able to navigate through them and get to these levels? First of all, I've been blessed. I've been extraordinarily blessed. And um, I do I do believe in learning. And I believe in listening. And I believe in not settling. And uh, very often the not settle means what do I need to do, much mm-hmm. less be so reliant on what others need to do. And I would see the opportunity and I would go after it. And what we sometimes forget is by doing that, it's not always about you striving to get whatever that next is, whether you get it or not, but it's also about your being watched. And um, just as often, there were people uh, who watched me either go for things or volunteer for things or the willingness to learn things. And it wasn't always uh, to my advantage. In some cases, that can make some folks insecure and literally piss them off. Mm -hmm. But 
overall, I say there are cases where folks would actually invite me uh, to consider a position or an opportunity. One of the ones that I have the most fun, to be quite honest with you, telling you about is how I went from uh, being at Chicago Tribune to the Chicago Cubs. Um, I, at the time, had left HR and had gone into sales and marketing. And so I had an outside territory and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I was called by Tribune Company to come back to headquarters. So I was somewhere in Indiana, and they told me to get in my car and come back. Now, I had just won a big sales contest, so I knew it couldn't be a performance issue, so I didn't worry about that. And I get back to find out what Tribune Company wanted was this person, which would be me, at Chicago Tribune to go to the Cubs and convince them that they needed this HR role. And I was uniquely picked out because I had the sales and marketing background and an HR background, and I could sell them on needing that role. The Cubs had no interest in bringing on an HR person. The, the, literally, the role did not exist in Major League Sports. There was no such thing as this human resource manager role yeah. in sports. You have owners, time. you have managers, you have players. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You had people doing aspects of what is HR, but not the way that we need to be doing it or that we do it now. And so my first meeting was really more like a sales pitch. Yeah, of course. Um, And so I prepared for it like you do a sales pitch. You do your homework, you do your reading, you find out as much as you can about the people, you know, who are the customers, sort of all that. Now, also, you know, a baseball fan, so I was going to ballpark anyway. Um, And so after having the initial conversation, the light went on, and I thought, well, the best pitch I could make is to go for the position itself. So I literally interviewed for the position. That didn't exist. It existed, but the Cubs turned everybody down. Oh. They would not hire, and that's why. It's like, go sell them. They need to do this. And so the most remarkable thing that actually happened, however, was I got the job. They offered me the position, and I turned it down. Oh. And it rang the bell. I mean, it caused, it caused calamity um, to the point the president of Tribune Company called me to his office on that one. I didn't even know this man knew I existed. You're always auditioning. Yes. That's what I told my son who's in theater, but it's not just about theater. You're always, someone's always watching. They're always watching. And whether you know it or not, you're always auditioning. You're always interviewing uh, just by your daily habits and your performance. But what did this president want to tell you? He wanted to tell me, how dare you? Do you know how hard we've been trying to make this happen? And I want to hear from you the reason you uh, decided to decline their offer. Hey, I'm glad you got the position, but why would you turn them down? And I looked him in his face squarely and said, money. And And I said, they offered me something based on my base salary. I've done very well here in sales, Mm -hmm. and I needed to be my whole compensation. And someone told me, Wendy, well, it doesn't work like that. You can't do that. And my reply was, it does work like that. My bank only sees one thing, and that's a deposit. Yeah. And if for some reason now I would cut that almost, you know, by a third, that's unacceptable for me and my family. So thank you for your consideration, but no. He applauded me. Uh, for, you know, holding, holding my own, uh, standing my ground, as I say. Um, but he told me, I want you to get back in the fight because they're going to open up this. They're going to have to, we're going to renegotiate this. And so I said, okay. And as I was leaving his office, I, I'll never forget this. He, he says my name. I turn around. He says, just as long as we understand something, you never get all you want. Okay. And I know that was hint, hint. Yeah. Get as close to the number as possible, yeah. but do not decline this offer. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did because I wanted the job. And that's how I ended up at the Cubs, and that was the beginning of my baseball career and never looked back. Outstanding. And we're talking today with UWO graduate Wendy Lewis about her career path, her experiences here at UWO. And um, now we're going to talk about 
Wendy Lewis LLC, uh, about allyship. We're going to talk about um, DEI. You've heard of the, 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 the terminology, diversity, equity, inclusion. Do you know what it means? Can you define it for us and how you are coaching companies about DEI, Wendy? Mm-hmm. So diversity as a whole really is a universal approach of the representation of people. And, um, and diversity just does not imply it is just black people or just people of color. It really is the whole range of humanity. That's what true diversity is. Now, when you get into diversity, equity, and inclusion, for the longest, it was diversity, and then it became diversity and inclusion, mm-hmm. and then it became inclusion, and then, and then the E that used to stand for equality became equity. So one of the reasons why I think uh, some folks just don't get it, don't want to get it, it's got to be confusing as heck. Mm-hmm. I've been in it all this time, and I have to check in every now and then and say, what are we calling it now? <laughs> Yeah. So it has been and will always be, uh, I will say, the determination of the representation of all people. Now, where, when it gets into what is more racial or multicultural diversity, that has really come about where organizations have decided that there is misrepresentation in their organizations and they want to change that. Um, very commonly for, for a long, long time, uh, primarily white institutions uh, knew without a doubt that there was not that representation of other people, other non-white people. In most cases, it was the fault of their own. Um, then it takes the civil rights movement, another, a number of movements, uh, to really get behind. It is not just about representation and showing up, but also the economic inequality. Because what was also being addressed is that where primarily black and brown people were, were very low levels in these organizations. So it's not like you couldn't get a job, you just couldn't get that job or the next job. And so it has been a work in progress for a long, long time. Um, And I used to refer to what are called chief diversity officers. And Mm -hmm. I've been uh, that myself uh, for a long time in my career Um, as, as really cultural anthropologist, um, because you needed to understand the organization, what the organization was needing, what the organization was lacking, and how to solve for that. And the solving for that is sort of this whole range of the diversity practice. Very often it's all about what you hear is pipeline, you know, where people are looking for that representation in the workforce. So making sure uh, what is the concentration of people? What does everybody look like at different levels in the organization? And then the folks really about their work, who's succeeding and who's not. And so that whole talent component of it has been the majority of the DEI work. Okay, so how do you define diversity? Does diversity look the same for every company? Absolutely not. Um, there is, um, we had a, a conversation earlier today And one of the um, strategies that I work on is called Dimensions of Diversity. And it's it's based on these these wheels, these dimensions of people uh, that a science team uh, developed many, many years ago. And they uh, boiled it down to one being the internal uh, dimensions of diversity. And these are the hardwired ones, the ones that they used to say you were born into and you cannot change. And so that was going to be age, and that was going to be sex or sexual representation. That was going to be gender, ethnicity, race, and I am forgetting one, uh, ability, and in, 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 in now we say ability, disability. Mm-hmm. And the reason why those are the, the core uh, of the work is that has been the, the go-to or the target or the measurement to determine How diverse is my organization or my population or my lifestyle? Uh, So that it's either the absence of those other components that I mentioned and maybe leaning so heavy into one, you know, lack of the other, or the other, uh, one of those dimensions actually making you 
less qualified or less mm. likely rather than adding to okay. those actually end up being takeaways. And so that's how diversity becomes a work around anti-racism, anti-discrimination, uh, uh, you know, uh, social justice, all of that, because it is the presence and lack of different characteristics of people uh, that is either used against them um, or becomes barriers, or now in the work of DEI is actually used to cultivate and enrich so that great organizations that want to lead well into the future know that they need that complexity of yeah, people Wendy, representation. We just can't find anybody. So that's a different problem. And that problem is um, that problem is a lie. There is no lack of talent all over the world. It's a matter of, do you really want to find anybody? And if you find somebody, what are you going to do with them? I have met way too many talented people all over the place to say you can't find anybody. Just, just say the track that you're in, whether that's, the, um, whether that's technology, uh, whether it's aerospace, whether that's auto mechanics, whether that's teaching, whether that's, uh, you know, medicine, whatever, whatever lane that is you're traveling in, there is no lack of talent. I think there is a lack of ability and willingness and also uh, a lack of admitting the truth that you don't want to change. You want mm -hmm. a homogeneous environment because that's where your comfort is. It's easier. Okay. You mentioned that it's hard work. We'll t ask you what that means in a second. Uh, but we're talking today with Lynn, Wendy Lewis, who is the founder and creator of Ally Shift and also of her own company, Wendy Lewis LLC. She's been uh, with a number of global uh, companies uh, and big companies here in the United States in HR-related uh, fields. And um, she considers herself an evangelist for life, liberty, and the pursuit of equity. And it seems to me, uh, after getting to know her and talking through her this conversation, that she's been practicing DEI since she was a little girl and all the way through her time at UWO. And, and what she's always done has been inclusive and understanding and now trying to help others be the same way. Why is it so hard, Wendy? It's hard for two reasons. Um, one, there, there needs to be a level of trust. So I'm trying to recruit you, you're trying to recruit me. Um, if I don't believe you and trust you that what you are welcoming to is not going to be there because it's proven to not be the case, I really don't want to. Um, likewise, you would feel the same way if I've proven to be disingenuous about saying who, what I'm about. And as you look around, it's like, well, you've been working at this for how long? This is what you all still look like? So that has come full circle. That's a good point. You've been working at this how long and you still haven't moved? If it was any other metric in your business, exactly, uh, you'd call yourself a failure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And that is what is unacceptable. Uh, the analytics and the data are super, super important. But all I know is what I see. So do you really need to measure you failed. Now, I would say in the last three years, particularly since 2020, changed the universe. A lot of diversity, equity, and inclusive practice like came to light. It was like it, it all of a sudden became Why? the World Series. Between COVID and the murder, particularly of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, the full light of day happened. Uh, COVID defied the the ecosystem so that no matter who, where, what you were, you could get this horrendous disease and you could die. But what happened is depending on where you were in this ecosystem, you're very likely to die. Meaning if you were an essential worker and you had to show up, mm -hmm. meaning if you had chronic predisposed health conditions, you were most likely uh, to, to die. Uh, meaning if you didn't have a housing environment where you could separate yourselves from others, where you could actually get sick but still live because you could live remotely. Meaning if you were a kid in school who didn't have access to the technology and the broadband of education, you just became depressed and failure was, 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 was a part of what you had to do. Not necessarily saying every, every 
everything I just characterized, resulted in death. But there was a lot of it going around. There was a lot of sickness going around. And we found that institutions that we relied on were no longer there. They had dried up in funding and things like that. And so we got caught in being left to our own devices. And that's why black and brown people, elderly people, poor people suffered immeasurably compared to everyone else. And so to me, that means whatever systems we had in place were more performative than they really were performing. Add to that the murders and our so-called racial awakening, and it's like, it hit the fan. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, everybody poured in. That diversity, uh, chief diversity officer, uh, that DEI leader became one of the most prominent and important people in the whole organization. Uh, your, your, your calls didn't stop. Your texts didn't stop. They needed you 24-7. Uh, when that happened, I was in a big global company, McDonald's Worldwide, and literally no matter where on the planet, things were coming in. What can I do? You know? And so the way that I, I shifted from sort of that corporate perspective to my own company in creating Ally Shift was, it was, it was pretty simple what happened. I saw everyone go all in and people were calling me how to answer questions on interviews because everybody was getting a diversity job. Yeah, but everybody can call Wendy Lewis. So do you, is this posted somewhere? <laughs> I want to know. What do you say? <laughs> Give that to my son. What do you say into an interview? Okay. It, it, was, it was hysterical with, you know, hey, Wendy, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm uh, applying for uh, a, a DEI role. And I said, really? I didn't even know you were interested in, in, in diversity work. Yeah, well, so-and-so is, um, has, a, has the a chief diversity role open. I said, whoa, 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 the CDO role? And that's when I said, what in the world is going on? I knew what was going yeah. on, but to have it be that clear. Now, I've been asked, did that bother me? being a seasoned professional, blah, blah, to sort of have all these walk-ons, you know, like in sports. Yeah, yeah, right. I said, again, using a sport analogy, all I know if somebody walks on and they're a major player and they can help the team, bring it on. Yeah. And if my spot can not supersede a walk-on, it's time to go. So it was, it was not about taking that personally. But did you, were you concerned that there were people who were taking on these positions who shouldn't be taking on these Absolutely. positions because they didn't have the experience? Absolutely. And maybe leading people in a direction they shouldn't be. So let, let me talk, let me, as I don't want to hold you up too long, talk to us about what Wendy Lewis LLC is about and what Ally Shift is as you talk about uh, these people who are getting these jobs that maybe they shouldn't have been getting. You know, I mean, I'll just say this one real quickly. I was more concerned about the authenticity, authentic, <laughs> about how authentic the organizations sure. were who were hiring than I, than I was about the people. Okay. So it was not so much being mad that you don't deserve or you're not qualified. To me, it told me everything about who that employer, that institution was. So to me, that was more problematic Absolutely. than the people. Because... Well, I, I think we understand that. That means if they're just willing to hire someone who may not be the best candidate, that shows where the priority is Absolutely. necessarily for that organization. Absolutely. Okay. Tell us about Wendy Lewis LLC and tell us about allyship. So, uh, you know, as I was saying, after all of that just fallout and calamity and pain, um, what we had was a universe of allies. You were seeing people all over the world uh, protesting, you know, in their response to, 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 to racial violence mm -hmm. and, and social injustice. And it was a marvelous thing and to watch. And it was watch. global. And it was. It was everywhere. I was getting pictures from everywhere. And not too long after that, you have January 6th. Mm -hmm. And I sit there and I watch January 6th and that insurrection take place at the exact same place where one time I sat to an inauguration of President Barack Obama. And there were so, so many people there during the inauguration, but there were so, so many people there on January 6th. And rather than wonder why they were there or how that could happen, it was like, where are the allies? 
How do you, you don't go from A to Z without all the stuff that's in between, up to including not only part of people who want to be Z. But what happened to all the, the you know, um, intersectionality of mm-hmm. all the things that keeps it from being that disruptive? Like, I can't keep you from doing anything. But I certainly don't open the door and welcome you back after you've been out there and done that either. And that I started to see just crumble. Um, so uh, needless to say, I was quite upset about all of that. And I'm talking to my daughter and really expounding on, you know, I got to do something. We got to do something. There's, there's, this is all going wrong. What happened to all the allies? We just got to make a shift. We got to make a shift in how we behave, what the expectations are, much more vigor around the practice. Got to make a shift. And my daughter just, just looks up at me. She says, well, then shift then. I said, <laughs> what? She says, Ma, you just said it. So ally shift. And that's where that term comes from. Okay. And that was the beginning and the birth of what I consider um, my body of work. And that the practice of moving from just being an ally to an ally shift, which is a much more profound and seismic and intentional approach about taking us where we need to be. And it's based on a, uh, a number of uh, behaviors and characteristics of being an ally. And they are either being a denier, a um, bystander, an upstander, uh, a mentor, a scholar, an advocate, and an activist. So it's a whole range of things, and on your next show we can talk about all. Of those. Who gets uh, <laughs> access to that? Who's who are you in front of talking about allyship? So um, I am meeting with great folks like Carrie and, and Chancellor a little bit here uh, here in Oshkosh, but um, I do a series of workshops, um, doing some coaching, some consulting. So in some cases, working with an organization and their leadership team. In other cases, working one-on-one uh, with individuals, uh, but also uh, doing two distinct uh, things that I hold myself responsible for. Uh, one is called Windy Wednesdays. So I'm nowhere near where you are right now, but one day I'll be there too in terms of uh, this great place in the podcast. Uh-huh. Uh, so on um, usually the winds, the first winds of every month, I entertain a conversation about ally shifting uh, with that, my selected person. We do that. Uh, but that comes from me launching something I call uh, Ally Shift Episodes. And Ally Shift Episode 1 was just last year in Kansas City at the Negro League Museum. And what we did, a day of deep body work around ally shift for economics for education in the environment. And I invited uh, subject matter experts in those different areas, and we just hashed it out, what it means in that, in that place, in that spectrum of work, and what can we do about it, and what are the takeaways for allies to know more about and do more about. Um, and my keynote was Nicole Hannah-Jones. That was okay. quite amazing. Um, and now Ally Shift Episode 2 is going to be in Jackson, Mississippi. And there we're going to Ally Shift around housing and home, oh, around right. the global um, uh, ESG movement, but making it local. Uh, so that whole social, environmental, and governance ESG. Thing. Yeah, ESG. Which um, is? Which is a new uh, corporate standard for I believe, social responsibility and accountability to the point it is the piece that ascends to the board and, uh, and, and beyond. And so organizations now are being transparent or accountable uh, up into uh, their investments in their stock around what is environment, so the whole climate uh, perspective. Uh, but also around social, and that's where you see a lot of the diversity pieces as well as their social responsibility and community engagements and investments. Okay. And lastly, that governance piece. Mm-hmm. And that governance piece is, to me, where the real work is. That's going to be policies. That's going to be board members. That's going to be in unique 
and direct strategic decisions that organization is made is making for where they are not only positioned today, but where's the future of the company going. So those three uh, have become big business and mm-hmm. become a big, uh, I'll say, action item uh, for a lot of your companies now, large and small. And so it's a it's a big practice. It's a global practice. But in Jackson, Mississippi, we're going to yeah. keep it local. And we're going to talk about how that applies to a city that is just having so many problems yes. and has been for a long, long time. And how, as allies, can we come together? And as I was challenged... Um, uh, by someone, I need you to make Jackson, Mississippi an ally. That was the challenge I was given. And that's why on next Wednesday, 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 um, my conversation will be with Ms. Janice Brooks from Jackson, Mississippi, who laid down the gauntlet and challenged that. And that's why episode two is going to be in Jackson, Mississippi. Outstanding. Well, Wendy Lewis, thanks so much for coming by and talking to us today. It's clear that you were born to do this. Uh, t- it, just talking to you, your life has evolved um, and you have the gifts and talents to execute what you've been executing. So more power to you. Thanks so much for coming by and talking to us today on UWO Now. Thank you. It has been truly a pleasure and a blessing. That's all the time we're going to have. So thanks everyone else for listening to UWO Now. Remember to catch the latest episode of UWO Now. Go to our website, wrc.org, and our podcasting platforms like Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, and you can also watch us on the UWO YouTube page. I'm Wendell Ray. Thanks so much for listening.